Hello, my name is Sue Smizer, and today's date is September 18, 2019. And I am the, rep the uh, Life Center receptionist, and I am representing the Historical Society's Genealogical Museum, currently located in Greenup in Cumberland County, Illinois. And we appreciate the cooperation and support of the Life Center uh, Cumberland County here in Toledo who have provided this facility to the Cumberland County Historical Society for the filming and helping to preserve the memories of our people, places, and things. This evening uh, we're, we are uh, talking with Paul Marty and we're pleased that you're a part of this effort to preserve our county's history. Paul, we're so glad to have you here. Good to be here so. And let's see if we spelled your name correctly. P A U L M A R T I. That is correct. All right. Is it any of our business uh, when you were born and how old you are? Well, Sue, I was born on January 11th in 1965, so I'm 54 years old. As a matter of fact, I brought with me today. This is the uh, hospital birth announcement telling what room I was in, what I weighed. I was 6 pounds, 13 ounces, 21 inches in length. Even has my head and chest circumference on there and my doctor's name. Uh, and I was in room 145, which interestingly enough was the same room my dad was in when he was born three days short of 25 years earlier and he was delivered by the same doctor. My goodness. This is the measuring tape they used to measure me. They provided all that to mom, and when she passed, she had a box with each of us kids' names on it, and this was in it. I was born without the tube that goes from your stomach to your esophagus, so I spent a month at the University of Illinois Research Hospital for Children in downtown Chicago, and this is the card for my room there. And I'm sorry, I said room 45, 145 earlier, it was room 430, 145 was at Chicago. Very interesting that your mother had kept all of that for each of you children. It's my footprints. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little bit larger now, I'm assuming. Uh, just slight. <laughs> How much? <laughs> so, um, you're married? I am married. And uh, do you have children? I have three children. Would you mind telling us some background on your wife and children? Certainly. Uh, I married Carrie Jo Sherwood on February 13th, 1988. She is the daughter of Janet Sherwood and the late Jerry Sherwood. Janet is the oldest or longest serving, I should say not oldest, but longest serving uh, school teacher in the history of the Cumberland School District. She started in the uh, grade school at Greenup and then taught at Cumberland. I believe had, she had a total of 47 years that she taught school. And Jerry was a local farmer and businessman. He owned and operated four service stations in Montrose, Jewett, Toledo, and Greenup, and then uh, Sherwood Oil and Tire uh, repair shop and tire shop there in Greenup and then later on in life after he uh, left the tire business and the, and the uh, gas business he opened a business uh, doing construction he did a lot of home building home repairs roofing things of that nature I see can you tell us a little bit about your children well my oldest daughter Ashley is 30 she is married to Bobby Cox he's a native of St. Elmo they live in St. Elmo they have he has two daughters from previous marriage, so when they got married, she got a family instantly. And those girls are 17 and 13, I believe now, Brooke and Dakota Cox. And Ashley works as a patient services representative at Heartland Dental in Effingham. My middle child, Shanna, is married to A.J. Hyatt from, New from Newton. He's the newest game warden down there in Jasper County, just being appointed. Uh, in fact, he won't take his seat, I think, till December when his father, who is currently the game warden there, retires. Uh, they've been married three years, I believe now. Uh, they have two children and a third one on the way on Friday. Unless she decides to have it earlier, she'll be induced on Friday and have her third. So we'll have our third grand or fifth grandchild, third natural born, two, two step grandkids. Sure. Uh, her kids are three and a half, 18 months, and on the way. <laughs> and then our son Daniel, he's, I should say Shanna is 
20, I'm thinking now, 27, 25, I'm sorry. She's 25 years old. And then our baby, he's Paul Daniel III, or just known to most people as Daniel. He's 22, and he is a coil builder at Evapco and lives in Greenup. Sounds like... Um I had read a little bit of background here, and it sounds like you have a pretty athletic family. I have been blessed. Both sides of my wife's family and my family had a lot of good athletes in them. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't really one of them. <laughs> I did play football and wrestled in high school, but I, I was okay, but I wasn't any, any great standout. But my wife's family has softball players in it that date back four generations. Uh, some of the great teams that came out of Cumberland County, Salem Church, were full of her relatives. Um, and her dad played for years. He's the home, uh, reigning home run king for the Casey Truckers. And Carrie, my wife, played softball and volleyball in high school. She was a three-time All-Little Illini Conference volleyball player. First one in Cumberland's history to be a three-time All-Conference player in volleyball. Uh, my daughters have both played softball for years. Uh, Ashley was a, started out as a pitcher and became a catcher and outfielder and played up until her senior year. She decided not to play her senior year of school. Uh, my middle daughter, Shannon, my middle child, she was a pitcher. She started playing travel ball at age seven on a 10 and under team and played for that team a couple of years. We moved to Indiana and she played on a couple of teams over there. We moved back. She went back to the Cumberland Vets then and uh, at nine she took up pitching full time and every year we'd go to camp over at Denny Thronberg's camp in Casey at the, West, at the Westfield School, but Denny was from Casey. And she would win the accuracy award every year. So we got dozens of t-shirts and other things <laughs> that she's won over the years at that. She was a first team All-State player her senior year. She was the pitcher on the Class A All-State team. And uh, she had a scholarship to Omni Central College and played ball there for two years. Had an offer to go on to St. Francis in Joliet, but decided not to because it would have required her to change her major and then come back and finish her major. And she was a radiology technician uh, student at the time, and she stayed at Alney for an extra semester or so and then finished her degree. So she wanted to do that rather than go on to play ball another couple years. And then our son Daniel played softball, or baseball, pardon me, in grade school and high school both, and a little travel ball as well. So yeah, we spent many years on the ball field, many years, about 30 of them, I'd say. <laughs> Sounds like you had quite an athletic family. But can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Uh, you mentioned something about where you were born and a little bit about your parents. Sure. Well, I was born in Kankakee, Illinois at St. Mary's Hospital. And uh, as I said earlier, same room as my father, same doctor delivered us, three days short of 25 years apart. I was born on the 11th of January. My Grandpa Marty, or my Grandpa Jones, rather, his birthday is January 8th. And my dad's is January 14th, so they had a little bet going on whose birthday I'd be <laughs> born on. So I was born right smack in the middle of them. <laughs> uh, we lived, when I was a kid, dad was a truck driver. And we moved around quite a bit, not because dad's job, but because mom liked to move. I, I've never met another human being like that, but she enjoyed moving. She had, did not want to stay in one place long. We gave up counting in about 100 different places we lived in our lifetime. Um, but we lived predominantly, the, at least the places I remember, were in Pontiac, Illinois, Piatone, Illinois, which is where we lived when my parents divorced, Cabri, Illinois, um, which actually I still have relatives in that area. Um, but Piatone's my first memory. We were there in the, I think, 69, 70, and 71. My parents divorced in 71 in May, and we moved up here, or they divorced shortly before that. We moved up here in May of 71 to Toledo. I was six years old at the time. My grandparents lived up here. My grandpa Jones's family is from the Spring Point Township area originally, so this was home to him, even though it was new to us. Mm -hmm. And so we came up to be to be with my mother's parents, obviously, and my aunt also lived up here at the time. So that's why we came to Cumberland County and fell in love with it. I left one time, couldn't stand it. After 22 months, I had to come back. Well, you know something, um, I knew your family. Uh, we all attended the same church. And something that I can remember, 
your mother loved to cook and have people over on Sunday after Sunday school. Yes, she did. And she would invite different ones from the church to come over for a fried chicken dinner. And she never got in a hurry. She just had us to come in and sit down in the living room while she went about her business in the kitchen. And we just visited and talked with each other. And I don't know how many people she did that for, but I think several. Oh, yeah. It was an unusual Sunday if we didn't have company. Very unusual. And Sunday nights after church, other times during the week, all the kids would be there. It, uh, Mom was a kid at heart. She never grew up that way. She always thought she was one of the kids. And as she got older, my kids and their friends dubbed her old lady. And she thought it was hilarious, and they called her old lady for years, which I thought was terribly disrespectful in the beginning, but she said, no, 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 I like it, I like it, just let them call me that. Of course, it raised some eyebrows, we'd be out in the community, and one of my daughter's friends, or one of the cousins, uh, my brother's kids, friends, or somebody would holler, hey, old lady, and everybody around would look, and those kids would get the glare from the, every parent and adult in the, in the room, but mom loved it. She was a kid, and she loved those kids, and... They all knew her, they all loved her, and uh, when she passed away, there was hundreds of, well, I don't know hundreds, but there was quite a few of them that came through the, the visitation, and, uh, you know, they were missing their old lady. <laughs> I'd like to go back just a little bit further to uh, when you were born and you were missing the tube down to your stomach. Yes. How did they repair that? What did they do? Well, they actually didn't. They just kept me in the hospital until it grew in. Um, my siblings like to remind me every now and then that I was what they call an immature baby. <laughs> <laughs> you hear about premature babies, you don't hear about immature babies very often, but that's what they called me because while I was fully grown and ready to be born, uh, my insides were not completely grown in. So they actually just kept me there, fed me intravenously, and took care of me until that for, grew in. For how long? I was there for a month. a month. And Dad tells me a story, or told me a story about when they got the bill. He was scared to death. He said, I didn't know we didn't have insurance, as most families didn't in the 60s. It was not as big a thing as it is now. And he said, I was scared to death what the bill was going to be and how we were going to pay it. And he finally, they were going to dismiss me, and he finally went to the desk to find out and get the bill. And if memory serves me right, it was eight cents. He had to pay for a pill or a, a medication that they would not cover. And that was it. Because it was a research hospital, much like uh, you hear about St. Jude's in different places now, they didn't charge. Mom and Dad stayed there, they fed them, they took care of me, all for eight cents for a month. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, do you know uh, your grandparents or your great-grandparents a little bit about them and how far back you can trace your history, where they came from? Okay. Well, the Marty side of the family, we have, and I, unfortunately, somewhere in all the moves I've made the last 30 years have misplaced it, but we have a family history that goes back all the way into the 15, 1600s in Switzerland. Huh. The Marty name, they tell me, in Switzerland is as common as Jones or Smith in the, in the United States. Um, we're from Canton, Bern, Switzerland, is where the family originated. They came over to the United States in the 1860s, 1870s, and the family split and settled in two areas. Part of the family moved to southern Wisconsin, and the rest of the family settled in Mokina, Illinois. And that's the side I'm from is from the Mokina, Illinois area, and one of the mayors of Mokina was Mayor Marty at one time, and there are a couple streets up there named after relatives. And my grandparents lived near that town their whole life. They were in Frankfurt and, and uh, other little towns around there, settled in Frankfurt for the end of their lives, but always in that area near Mokina. And most of my family, still to this day, the Marty family lives up in that area. So you knew your grandparents then? I did. I didn't know my great-grandparents on the Marty side, but I did know my grandparents. Uh, my grandpa, Ezra Marty, was born in 1900. He passed away in 1975. I was 10 years old. Um, he was a bit of a miser. <laughs> um, he owned grain elevators. Interesting story. When he started these grain elevators, uh, he wanted to purchase one. And a lady in the town that he lived in, he went and talked to her about a loan. 
and she gave him an interest-free loan to buy that elevator. And when he went to pay her off, she would not accept all of the money. She told him, keep that money, keep your business going good, you're doing a good job, stay involved with your business with that money. Wouldn't accept it all back. Um, you wouldn't see that anywhere these days, especially not interest-free. <laughs> But uh, he had a couple of elevators. Um, he was a surveyor. He farmed. Uh, he worked as a security guard for a large outfit in Chicago for a while. Uh, he was a small man height-wise. He was only about 5'1 or 5'2. But uh, he had some weight on him like this old boy does. And he always wore Oshkosh Bagosh coveralls, except when he went to church. And sometimes he even wore them with a suit jacket over them. <laughs> He was quite a character. He uh, sold part of their farm off in Frankfurt, and they built the first country club in the Chicagoland area right next to their property. It was called Prestwick. It's still in operation today. It's a big subdivision and country club, golf course. It's been there ever since I can remember, since the 60s. Um, he surveyed a lot of the lots for that for them. And there was a railroad trestle run, or railroad tracks ran between the house where they lived and Prestwick and a bunch of trees. And Grandpa used to get us on his wheel horse lawnmower and he had a big wagon he'd pull behind it and take us around his, through his property, down under the railroad trestle, through the woods and over into Prestwick and tell us about the houses that he'd surveyed the ground for. And they, uh, they were always real good to him and good neighbors. They never bothered anybody. You never saw or heard anything over there. And, uh, but that was, that was one of his claims to fame, was Prestwick Subdivision and Country Club. And what about your maternal grandparents? Well, I'll tell you about my, my grandfather's wife first, because kind of interesting. Her name was Emma Marty, but her maiden name was Weichbrot, W-E-I-C-H-B-R-O-D-T. She was German. Don't know much about her family. I know she had a brother named Emil, but I don't know much about a lot of the family, she had a sister named Barney, her real name was Bernice, but everybody called her Barney. Her husband was the Will County State's Attorney for several years. Uh, I have a hard time remembering his first name's Albert, Albert Cruzmark, but everybody called him Cruzy, so I always have to stop and think what his first name was. But uh, Grandma's family, going beyond that generation, I don't know much about them, and I think probably because of World War II, they grew up during that time period, mm -hmm. and I think being German, it was a little bit maybe embarrassing to them, and so they didn't talk much about their history or their family. So I don't know much about her, but she, uh, she was a great lady, very involved in her church. Uh, she was a health food, we called her a nut when I was a kid, <laughs> health food nut. That was the common term back then. They don't call you that now. But uh, she, she taught me to eat yogurt, a lot of fresh fruits and things that uh, I probably would not have eaten had I not grown up around her as a small child. She was, she was quite a lady, quite an interesting lady. Um, you asked about my mother's side of the family. My grandmother, Marie Jones, her last name, her maiden name was O'Daniel. She was Irish. I don't know a lot about her family beyond that generation either. Um, she had two brothers and a sister that I know of, or two sisters that I know of. They all lived in the Chicago Heights and Sauk Village area of Illinois uh, until their passing. And all great people enjoyed them. My Uncle Earl lived in the basement of the home. He, he rented the basement off my Aunt Ruth. He was loved by all the kids in the area. He had been a coach on one of the ball teams, if you remember the movie A League of Their Own. He had coached one of those softball or baseball teams of, of ladies during the war that played. and. Uh, he loved kids. He was a single man his whole life, bachelor. He had computer games before I seen anybody have computer games. I saw Pong probably 10 years before I saw it commercially in his basement where he lived. And he had railroad trains, uh, HO, HO trains and stuff all over the basement. And he, it was a kid's paradise. He was a big kid. And they had, in Sauk uh, Village where they lived, they had a ice cream truck that came around with its little whistle and bells and stuff. Uncle Earl would buy ice cream for every kid in the neighborhood. When that truck would come, 30 kids would show up out of nowhere, and he'd buy them all ice cream. He was, he was loved by everybody in the neighborhood. But uh, other than that generation, I don't know much about my grandma's family. Now, my Grandpa Jones, um, his family's kind of interesting. 
his father passed away when Grandpa was very small, and his mother passed away when he was young also in high school age. Um, don't remember exactly what age, but he actually slept on her grave when he was a kid oh. out in Brush Creek, at Brush Creek Cemetery out south of Neoga, or yeah, south of Neoga. Um, Eck and Edna Burton, which were great citizens of Cumberland County for many years, Eck caught my grandpa stealing apples from them. That's how he was living. He was foraging and, and he was taking apples from Eck's uh, orchard and Eck discovered he was doing this and took him in and they kind of helped him get started in life because he was, like I say, high school age. Grandpa was a truck driver for many years and then when they moved back down here from Chicago land, he lived in Kankakee, Chicago area, um, they were building the Cumberland School, the grade school, and they'd had some kind of an issue out there. I don't remember exactly the story anymore, but I don't remember somebody stole some things, painted some things. They'd had some kind of problems out there, and they hired Grandpa as a security guard while they were building the school. So he worked out there for, I think, about a year, and then he was hired, and this is a picture of him. It's kind of dark. I don't know if you'll be even able to get a good picture of it, but he became the night constable in Toledo. At that time, they didn't call him chief of police. They were called the night constable. This is him in his uniform. It's a house just a couple blocks from here where they lived when we first came to town. And then from that job, he became a deputy sheriff for Ronnie McMacken. When Ronnie was sheriff, this is Ronnie and this is Grandpa, Don Wickey. And I'm sorry, I don't recall all the other gentlemen's names um, in this picture. I wish I did. I used to know them. Well, I know one of them is a Pennington, but I don't recall all the names anymore. It's just been too many years. When Ronnie resigned the sheriff's office, Grandpa was appointed sheriff, and this picture is of Grandpa and Grandma. She was the matron, Don Wickey and his wife, and Don was the chief deputy, and then the other deputies, and this is my Uncle Larry Jones, who was a deputy at that time. Uh, my other Uncle Larry, my Uncle Larry McLean, became deputy as well, um, and served with Grandpa a year or two. And then he was defeated in the election when he ran the first time by Lou Colesapple, who went on to be the longest serving sheriff in Cumberland County history and uh, did, a, did a fine job. We've never had any problems with Luke beating him because actually Grandpa passed away about a year later, so it was probably well that he was not in office and created that uproar. After they just had a sheriff resign, it was kind of a, a big issue for appointing someone, so you'd hate to have seen them had to do that again. And Luke was a great neighbor. We actually lived next to the jail, and he was great to us kids and a great neighbor. Loved him and Ruby like they were my own grandparents. So, Was there um, something about a, a car wreck at the Seven Mile Yes. Curve? There were two things that I really recall from Grandpa's time as sheriff that really stand out to me. There was a gentleman in a convertible that had a wreck on a Seven Mile Curve, and they had to remove... This is kind of gory, but they had to remove parts of his body from the tree where he was ejected up into the tree. And that was kind of uh, one of those things as a small kid you never forget hearing about. And then another incident that took place on the square, Grandpa was sitting, at that time the sheriff's office, and these pictures are of the jail portion of the building, but right over here was the residence that the sheriff lived in. And the phone rang, and Grandma, as I recall, answered it and said, Otis, it's for you. Grandpa's name was Otis Jones. I don't think I even said that earlier. Um, and he took the call, and it was a gentleman from Neoga who asked Grandpa to come up on the square. He wanted to talk to him. And Grandpa drove up there, and when he did, the gentleman stepped out of his truck and said, Otis, I didn't want anyone to get blamed for this, and shot himself. Died on the spot. Those are the two things I remember the most about Grandpa being sheriff because they were such shocking things. I've tried to find it. I had it at one time and I can't find it. There was an article actually at UPI picked up the story of the gentleman that shot himself and I saw it years later going through some archives for the uh, newspaper down in, uh, oh heavens, I forgot the name of the town, down in Missouri. Um, but it was, a, it was run as an international story about this gentleman shooting himself. And yeah, that I, I would have been uh, a hard thing to go through. I, it bothered Grandpa, I know, quite a bit. Yeah. Well, can we talk a little bit about your uh, grade school days and sure. your, uh, what you remember Certainly. about your grade school time, uh, how you got to school, 
and a little bit about the teachers that you had. Okay. Well, I loved school as a young kid. Uh, I was a little bit backward, believe it or not, when I started. But uh, as I aged, I got a little better about talking. These are report cards from third grade, reading and science classes. That's amazing. And uh, then I have these from high school Spanish class and what they call ISCS or a science class. Um, teachers sent home letters to the parents saying that uh, they had, uh, had done outstanding work in their classes. So. And it looks like you were a straight-A student. Well, at one time, yeah. I, uh, I got interested in sports and girls in high school, so that kind of fell apart. Uh, and I worked my senior year. I had a newspaper route in the morning, went to school all day, and then worked for the district as a janitor from 4 o'clock to midnight. So kind of hard to really focus on your studies when you're doing that and you got a girlfriend and you're paying for a car. And I was involved in some plays and, and involved in the music program, so quite busy that senior year. But I didn't need any credits my senior year. I was there for the social life, to be honest. So my grades kind of suffered because I really didn't take it serious enough. But uh, yeah, most of my life I was A's and B's. And the teachers that you had? I loved several of my teachers. I remember when I came to Cumberland, Mrs. Glosser was my kindergarten teacher. I only went to Cumberland for 22 days because I went to kindergarten in Piatone, Illinois, at the Piatone grade school. And uh, the day I left Piatone, I don't remember the teacher's name. I wish I knew it. But she stood all the students up and had each one of them shake hands with me and wish me well when I left and moved away. And it's one of those things you never ever forget. I don't care how old you get, it just it stuck with me for years. Um, so I came to Cumberland then, didn't know anyone, walked in the first day, they walked us down to class, introduced me to the teacher, and the first person that I saw was Troy Carl. And Troy was about a head, like he still is now, about a head taller than everybody else in the class. And I heard him, they called me Danny then because of the confusion at home with two Pauls. I went by Danny. I remember him yelling across the room, come over here and sit with us, Danny. And Troy and I are still friends. We've been friends for years. Um, but he was the first person I met at Cumberland. I had Mrs. Glosser for kindergarten. Had uh, Adeline Rogers as my first grade teacher. Her husband was a superintendent, or pardon me, he was the high school principal at the time. Somewhere here, I set down a picture of that class. Here it is. This is Mrs. Rogers in our first grade class. And will I recognize you here? I don't know. I might have to look to recognize myself <laughs> after that many years. Uh, I think maybe you'll have to tell me which one you are. I am right here. I almost started to say that because of blonde hair. Uh -huh. <laughs> my hair was so blonde when I was little, my Aunt Bernice, who I mentioned earlier, we called her Aunt Barney, she called me Mr. Whitehead for years. That was my name when I went up north back to visit relatives. I was Mr. Whitehead. But Adeline was my first grade teacher. I had uh, Louise Jones in second grade, and she was a great teacher. Then third grade, we got to that place where you moved classes. We were really big. You know, we went to three different classrooms. And I had some great teachers in third and fourth grade. Rosalie Chancellor, who took the time, and, and I'll never forget this if I live to be 100, and it meant so much to my dad. She took the time to write my dad a letter and tell him how I was doing in school. He wasn't here. He didn't see our report cards. He didn't know what was going on with us. At the time, he was living in California. Um, when he passed away, he still had that letter and his items that, he, his most treasured items. I've got that letter now at home. Uh, she also mentioned to him that she'd had my sister Vicki in class as well. It's one of the things I'll never forget. And Rosalie's a good friend of mine. I consider her a good friend. She's just a sweet lady, and she did a great job teaching school, and I, I feel a lot of debt to her. And Henrietta, or Harrietta Montgomery also was my math teacher, and she was one of my favorites. She was a big Cardinal fan, St. Louis Cardinals baseball, and I was a big, and still am a big, San Francisco Giants fan. And we just gave each other the <laughs> devil all the time about the ball. And she'll tell you the story, if you ever see her, and ask her about me, of her being stepping out of the school one day and one end of the building and I was like on the blacktop somewhere on the other side of the building and yelling something about the Cardinals at her. I don't remember exactly what the comment was, but she's never forgot it and she tells it to me every now and then. Uh, she was a treat. And uh, then 
probably Bob Blade. Uh, he had a huge impact on me as a student. Um, he took me aside one day in class, and after class, and he said, uh, when are you going to start getting serious? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're not living up to your potential. I thought, I got A's in your class. What's, what's the problem? And he said, you're, you're, you should be doing more than you are. He gave me a reading list of books he wanted me to read over the summer. A bunch of novels. I went to the library up here in Toledo faithfully, became good friends with the two librarians. They thought I was the whiz kid of the world I know because this kid would show up and have this list of novels and want to know if they had them and read them all and bring them back in a day or two. Uh, just Louise and I can't remember the other lady's name anymore there at the library at Toledo were good friends of mine for years just because of Bob instilling in me a, a love of reading. and. I consider Bob a friend still. We argue politics and do other things on Facebook now and then. And uh, every now and then I'll write something and then I'll say apologies to Bob because of my English. Because <laughs> he was my literature teacher in language arts. And, and uh, I'm probably not as good at that now as I was back then. Get away from those habits as you get older. So did you walk to school or ride the bus? We rode the bus. Um, Ben's Cumberland was a rural school. We had to have some way to get there and the buses were the way. Um, most of my life we lived in Toledo, uh, my school years. We did for a short time live over by Hazeldell. I don't recall who my bus driver was over there. We were only over there a few months. Um, and we did live south of town for just a little while on John Sour or Jim Sowers' farm. And Eugene St. John was my bus driver for that little span of time. But most of the time we were in town, we rode the same bus for years. Jack Jenkins was our first bus driver, and he was bus driver for several years in my grade school. And then Edna Wade followed him, and then Emory Gast, or as we called him, Junior Gast, was my last bus driver. And it seemed like we only ever had two substitute bus drivers all the years I went to school. The only two I really remember were Doc Kelsheimer from Casey and Reva Shelton, the school band and music teacher in the grade school. Um, but yeah, I got along with my bus drivers, talked to all of them, enjoyed, you know, riding the bus. They were all friendly and easy to get along with. And we never had a lot of problems on our bus, although I do remember one time a couple getting into it and a kid taking a big old industrial-sized lunchbox to a girl's head. <coughs> and then I had to go to the principal's office and tell them all about it, because <laughs> I witnessed it. <laughs> but uh, other than that one episode, our, our buses were pretty quiet and everybody got along and had a good time riding the bus. Well, what about high school? What did you like the best and the least, and uh, college, the degrees that you pursued? Okay. Well, high school, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of got interested in other things as I got older um, than my studies. But I was in Spanish for four years. I had four years of English, four years of choir. I was heavily amused, involved in the music program and the uh, school plays. I always enjoyed music. I, I love music ever since I can remember. My grandmother recorded me when I was probably four years old. I don't think I was five yet. Singing There Were Twelve Disciples, which I couldn't tell you the words to it now, but I know that was the name of the song and it, quote, it said every disciple's name, which I have, I could probably get six or eight now and that'd be it. But uh, I knew them all at four. She recorded it on, my, on a little tape recorder she had with a microphone. And boy, I, I was cool. I had a microphone in my hands, you know. She played that everywhere we went for about a year. If anybody hadn't heard it, they were going to get to hear it. And sometimes they heard it two or three times. <laughs> and it kind of sparked something in me that I found out that, okay, somebody thinks I'm good at something. And so I had a lot of, tr a lot of fun with music over the years, and I got real involved in it in school. In my senior year, I joined a, a band. Um, outside of school, a band called The Descenders, and we played local events. In fact, we played, the last thing I did with them was a fundraiser to build this building that we're sitting in. That was in 1984, uh, Valentine's weekend in 1984. We played a Valentine's dance at the uh, Greenup Municipal Building. I think it was 1983, I'll take that back. Um, that was a fundraiser for the Life Center to help them build a building. At that time, they were operating out of two trailers sitting up here in the front of the parking lot. 
And that's also the night I met my wife. I had seen her before, but I never talked to her or anything until that night. So that, that night sticks in my memory a little. Um, but classes in high school, I played football and wrestled. I enjoyed that the years I did it. Um, just freshman year for football and freshman sophomore year for wrestling. Um, uh, music was my thing. I love music, and that's kind of where my, I had my, my best time. Um, Susan Hiddle was the band and music director at that time, and we're still good friends. I talked to her on Facebook from time to time. We've been talking about getting the choir back together and doing a reunion because it's been so many years since we've all been together, but haven't quite got that accomplished yet. But I loved, loved working with her. She was a great lady. What about the workplace, the jobs that you've had, what you liked the most and what you liked the least? Oh boy. I'm one of those people who, and this probably comes from my mother, my mother moving so much, I have a little bit of that in me. Um, I like to improve myself and I like to move from job to job. Not that I don't want something I can retire at, but if there's an opportunity within the corporation that I'm working for, I try to move to another position and move up all the time. I started out my first real job, I guess, I worked at the Holiday Inn in Mattoon for a short time, and then I worked for uh, the KZIGA as a night manager. I got hired as a night manager. A friend of mine was leaving there and recommended me for the job. Went over and talked to Bill Williams, who was the manager at that time, and he hired me on the spot when he found out I was the president of the JCs in Toledo at that time. He was very impressed by the JC organization and felt like I'd be a good, good fit. Uh, worked there for about a year or so, and they had a gentleman who would come in and clean the floors every night. And he had a buffer and a scrubber and a couple of mops, and he'd come in and do the floors. Or actually, he came in twice a week, I believe. And I got to talking to him one night, and he told me he was trying to get out of that business. Well, I went and talked to a friend of mine, and we bought that business. And we built it up into something we had not only the KZIJ, but the Greenup IGA, the Eisner Store in Toledo, Copy X in Charleston, Peterson Spring in Mattoon, and then we did homes and different other odd jobs. We worked for the funeral homes in Mattoon a couple of times. Uh, I bought a carpet machine. We did carpet cleaning for a while. Built it up into a pretty good business, but I was having some trouble physically, and after a few years had to shut it down because I just couldn't do it. I didn't know then what was quite wrong with me, but later on it made itself apparent. Um, I actually have two sleep disorders and trying to work nights and then I also had an issue with my stomach for several years. I had to have some surgeries and all of that was building up and causing me problems. I really couldn't work. Those hours were mostly night hours and it was hard on me. But I went back to the IGA and worked there another year as a night manager uh, before I left there. Uh, and I left shortly before we got married. I went to work uh, for a plumber, uh, J.W. Jerry Ward, J.W. Plumbing out of Greenup. Worked for him as a plumber's assistant for about a year. That was interesting, cold, nasty work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, enjoyed working with Jerry, but boy, it was miserable work. Most of the time I worked for him, we were either under a house thawing pipes or digging holes or laying in water trying to get water pumped out from under some house. Um, and I actually got stuck tight under a house one night in, or one day in Greenup, and they had to cut the floor out to get me out. Uh, Jerry couldn't get in there. He was a big man, height-wise and, and broad-shouldered, and he couldn't get up and down in there where they needed some work done, so I had slithered down in there. I was a bit smaller then. Um, and when I got in there, I started to come back out, and I got fast, and they had to cut the floor out of that home to get me out of there. So that, uh, that pretty much done it for me as far as a plumber's assistant. I didn't like that feeling and I didn't want it to happen again. So I left Jerry. Um, i trying to remember what I did do next. Oh, I went to work for uh, Whitmer Furniture in Charleston. I managed their warehouse for a couple of years. Uh, Steve Whitmer and, and Ralph Whitmer owned it when I first started working there. We underwent a huge fire. They had a huge building on Route 16 between Mattoon and Charleston and it caught fire one day and burnt to the ground. That was a pretty traumatic experience. Um, didn't know if I was going to have a job after that or not, but we bought the building in, in town and moved in town. We were in a temporary spot for about six or eight months and then moved into another building in town. And uh, they were wonderful to work with. After the fire, Ralph 
got out and Steve owned the building by or owned the business by himself. But I had a couple friends of mine, Alan Edgar, who you know worked for me then in the warehouse, and uh, just enjoyed that work very much. In fact, Alan helped us build that new building's interior up so we could put our carpeting up and put our racks in for our furniture and things. He's a pretty good you know, carpenter, uh, handy guy. Um, so I worked for Whitmers for a couple, of year, a couple of years, and Betty Bohannon kept coming around. I was friends with Scott all through school, and especially our junior and senior year, and we hung out a lot together. And I really liked and respected Betty. And she kept coming around talking to me about selling insurance. I didn't know if I was a salesman or not. She finally convinced me I should try it. So I went and took my state test and passed it and went uh, to work for Reliable Life Insurance out of Effingham, which is who she worked for. They had bought the business of Rockford Insurance, which more people around here probably remember the Rockford name than Reliable Life. But that was an old debit company where every month you went to each of your clients and collected their fees. Uh, that was a bit tricky. <laughs> it was a hard way to make a living. Some people did well at it, I didn't. Uh, so I worked for them for a while and I got a call from a guy from Banker's Life and Casualty in Decatur and he offered me a job. I went to work for him and I was there a very, very short time and I found out that the gentleman who was the administrator or facility manager at the driver's license facility in Charleston had passed away. They had an opening. And I knew some folks in government from having worked in politics for years on campaigns and things and I made some calls and they told me how to take the test and how to do everything. And I took the test and I was lucky enough to get hired for that job. So I became the facility manager at the Charleston Driver's License Facility, or Secretary of State's office, as they call it. I was there about seven or eight months, and the manager's position in Mattoon came open. Mattoon had a nicer building, better location, um, more modern, uh, more diverse staff. And so I transferred over and became the manager at the Mattoon facility. I was there roughly a year and a half, and I was offered a position as a regional trainer and accepted that and I then was in charge of about 20 offices throughout central Illinois and, and south central Illinois uh, from Bloomington area down to Effingham and did all the training for those offices. Anything that changed in the office or anytime a new employee came on, state law would change about anything we dealt with because we didn't only do driver's license but we had all the title work and the stuff for the Illinois Department of Revenue to collect your taxes. So there were other aspects to the job and we had to keep up on all of that and my job was to train everybody. Loved that job, but the Secretary of State's office is the worst paying job in the state of Illinois' system of state jobs uh, because it's not under the governor. And the governor's people get paid better. So after seven years at Secretary of State, I found out that the administrator at the Department of Human Services here in Toledo was retiring. So I put in to transfer and was Again, lucky and got that position, and I spent seven years there at the Department of Human Services as the administrator there. Had a great staff. In fact, I'd like to show you something we did. Uh, we made the New York Times. How one county cleared the welfare rolls, front page story. Um, they interviewed a friend of mine, Holly Kane, who was the manager of the facility in Rushville. They were the first facility in the state to not have anyone on cash assistance. We were the third. For some reason, the New York Times decided to skip over the second county, and they called me and interviewed me as the third county that became cash free. And so we made the front page of the New York Times, and then I forget what page this was, where the story was finished out, but had a nice interview with this gentleman. His name was Robert Pear. I'll never forget it. Uh, just a wonderful gentleman to talk to. And uh, had a nice interview. Did the local papers pick that story up? Uh, they did not, which kind of frustrated me a little. Um, the Toledo Democrat had run something about us being uh, cash free earlier than this, but they did not pick up the UP or the AP story and carry it. Uh, it was carried in the Springfield and the Champaign papers. It was carried nationwide. I mean, if you made the New York Times in those days, unlike sometimes now, um, it was considered the paper in the, in the states so it was carried nationwide in a lot of newspapers my father lived in in ohio at the time if i recall correctly and he picked it up in his local paper as well 
So it was carried all over. And my staff were excellent. I had a great staff there, and they really did a good job. Unfortunately, the state started talking about closing offices because they needed money. I knew that Cumberland County was on the short list because we're one of the smaller counties in the state. They came around and they offered 27 county administrators and assistant administrators, depending on the size of your county, a buyout to leave. And I left. I was the only one in our 27 county region that did. Of the others who remained, all but one either ended up quitting, retiring without the benefit package that we were given if we'd have left early, or being transferred around until they eventually quit. One gentleman remained. He was an assistant in Coles County when this happened. He ended up in Effingham County and then back in Coles before he retired. Uh, but initially, I think they sent him to Cairo. The administrator and marshal they sent to Chicago. Uh, basically, they tried to run him off is my best way of putting it. They just moved him around and, and played with him until they left. But they didn't want to pay them because they were the higher salaried employees. So they were trying to cut costs, and that's how they did it. So I left state employment. Um, didn't know if I, what I wanted to do and if I could even find a good job like that again, but I got to looking and watching the Indianapolis paper and different other large newspapers. Came across a job with a company selling insurance again and talked to the recruiter, had a lovely visit with him. They promised me the world. Uh, looked him up on the Better Business Bureau's rankings. They had a good ranking. But when I went to work for them, none of the things they promised me came true. Um, they promised me so many leads a week, people they had talked to on the phone that were interested. The first place I went to sell something for them, I knocked on the door. It was a Methodist minister. I told him who I was and why I was there. He said, I don't understand. I told him I didn't want that. Great folks. They fed me pie, talked to me for an hour, but they didn't want any insurance. <laughs> uh, we had a great visit. Lovely folks. Uh, and that was the first place I realized when I'd moved to Indiana right near a... Uh, a live fire military uh, installation. I was sitting there and their windows started shaking and I started hearing stuff and he said, oh, don't worry, that's just Muscatatuck. And I said, what? He said, that's just Muscatatuck. I said, what's that? And he said, oh, they're dropping test bombs over there at the airfield. <laughs> <laughs> Scared me to death, but he wasn't, even, he wasn't even shaking. I kept jumping every time it happened. He said, we hear this all the time. <laughs> But I left that insurance company and went to work for Aflac in Indianapolis. Um, great company, wonderful products. In fact, when I was sick years, a couple years before that, they took real good care of me. Um, great, like I say, great company. But I was down in an area they hadn't worked, and they wanted us to only work with businesses and try to sell them benefit packages. And I didn't know anybody in that area, having just moved there, and so I had quite a time. I won what they call their Fast Start Award, and I always wondered if I was a fast starter, <laughs> what the slow people were doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw an ad in the local paper, in the Seymour newspaper, um, that Experience Works, a program we used to know as Green Thumb, it's a senior employment program, was looking for someone to manage 17 counties of their program in southeastern Indiana. And I applied for that job and was lucky enough to get hired for that. And so for a year I worked for them managing southeastern Indiana and employing elderly folks who were wanting to get back into the job market, getting them some skills to get back into the job market. It was a very rewarding job, a very fun job. Uh, I actually got to meet Mike Pence, who's now our vice president. At that time he was the congressman in the area north of where I live, but in the area where I worked. Um, had dinner with him one time, and then he came and worked one of our events uh, where we had a, like a celebrity uh, waiter and waitress situation. He came and waited tables. Really nice guy, just very down to earth. And it's kind of neat to say you met the sitting vice president, and of course he wasn't at that time, but still it's pretty neat to say. Uh, but after I'd been there a year, my wife got recruited to a job back in Charleston, and we were missing Cumberland County bad. All our relatives and family were here. And we were living in North Vernon, Indiana at that time. Nice town, uh, very much on the move. Uh, the mayor of North Vernon, the mayor of Seymour, and the mayor of uh, a larger town north of them, uh, the name of it, it's, I forget, uh, slips my mind at the moment, would go to Japan every year and recruit the Japanese 
industries. And so we had a lot of factories in that area that were run by the Japanese. Um, so there's a lot of employment opportunities for factory jobs and, and other small businesses that fed the factories. Um, so there was, it was a good area to live in. But the problem that I found with it was there was nothing that was down home. There was no place to meet people. There was no coffee shop. There was no... I went to the barber shop one time to get a haircut, and I was the only person in there. And I got to talking to the barber, and he said, you're the only person I've had today. And it was about 3 in the afternoon. I didn't understand that. I mean, come here, you'll sit in the barber shop, and there'll be 10 people in there in an hour. But uh, I couldn't really get to know folks. So we kind of felt like we were on an island living over there. And when the opportunity to come back home came up, we came back. Eventually, we ended up with the same home, living in the same town. After about a year, I got in, well, probably six months, I guess, I got into another field, which was in the same type of work I'd worked in prior to leaving. We even had the same phone number, and I could have had my P.O. Box number back if I would have uh, been willing to give a donation, a large donation to the Grant Chamber of Commerce, because they had gotten my P.O. Box. But my cousin was, at the time, uh, their secretary treasurer or something, and she said, you know, if you want to make a donation to cover the cost of us changing all our paperwork, we'll give you your box back. I said, no, it's not worth that. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of odd that all those things just kind of reverted. We almost went back to our old life. Uh, so for about six months after we moved back, I did not have a job. Carrie was working for Mark Essary in Charleston, Illinois, a local eye doctor. And uh, I finally found a position with a company that was taking over managing the medical aspect of the, Medi the Medicaid program in Illinois called Automated Health Systems. They're based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wonderful company. They gave me a brand new Nissan to drive. After two years, they bought me another brand new Nissan. Um, could drive it for all my personal use. They didn't care. We paid $10 a week for our personal use of the vehicle, which we use more than that in gas. Um, but they were just a great outfit to work for. I started out in central Illinois, taking care of doctors, of primary care doctors in central Illinois, and then they moved me to southern Illinois, which I loved. Got to know a lot of folks down in southern Illinois, and I also had offices I visited in Missouri, Indiana, and Kentucky. And so I had about 1,500 miles of driving a week, and I had about 500 doctors we were supposed to meet with once each quarter. And then special things would come up where you'd have to see them over and above that. But I was a road warrior and loved it. I, I can remember one day I was on the Penny Ryle Expressway in Kentucky and it was about 70 degrees in the spring. I had the windows down the car, just driving along, letting the wind blow through because winter was just ending, you know. And I was thinking to myself, I get paid to do this. You know, this is incredible. <laughs> it was a wonderful job. I was there for seven years. And the state started talking about changing how they did their Medicaid program. They wanted to move to managed care. Well, one of the managed care companies came along and offered me a position. Their name was Molina Healthcare. They were out of uh, Long Beach, California. Went to work for them, had a real interesting experience. They flew me to Long Beach. That was my first airplane flight. They had a travel agent call me, and I said, listen, I've never flown. I." I'm intimidated by big airports. I've been to O'Hare many times, but I can't find my way around. I get lost real easy in those places. I said, so if you can, fly me out of Indianapolis because it's smaller. I know, I know I can get right in and out of it. And I said, you know, if you can avoid bigger airplane, bigger airlines, or bigger airports, pardon me, try to do so. Well, she said, sure, we can do that for you, no problem. She, they mailed me my ticket. I got on the airplane and Indianapolis and flew to Dallas Fort Worth, one of the busiest airports in the world, and changed planes and then flew to LAX, Los Angeles Airport, which is another one of the largest airports in the world. Uh, our plane was late, so I missed my flight, my connecting flight in Dallas, and was scared to death, having never flown, having no idea what I was supposed to do to get another flight. I uh, got off the plane, one of the gentlemen who'd been sitting in a row in front of me looked at me and he said, you have no clue what you're doing, do you? And I said, no, I don't. He said, what's going on? And I told him that we'd missed our flight. He said, okay, turn here, go down here to this desk. And I no more than got the directions from him and they called my name over the PA and told me to come to that desk. 
I got there and they said, you're boarding such and such a plane in five minutes, get on this trolley and go. And I think we went about six miles on that thing to the other side of the airport. I was afraid I wasn't going to catch that plane either, but we did catch it and flew on to LAX. That was quite an experience for a little small town guy that had never flown. But I loved flying. It was really enjoyable. Really enjoyed the flights back as well. Um, so I worked for Molina for a short time. We had a parting of ways. I'll be nice and generous to them. I uh, didn't agree with some things they wanted me to do, and they didn't agree with my disagreement. And so we parted ways. Um, after that, I started my own business, Paul Marty Productions, which was a booking agency and promotional business for uh, country music and comedy acts. And did that for a little while, wasn't getting rich doing that because it's, uh, it's a tough industry to get into when you're brand new. Uh, so I found a couple little marketing companies and went to work for them part time and was doing that. I happened to be in the county market in Charleston one day and the manager come by and said, what are you doing? Because he knew I worked for the one marketing company, but he didn't know I worked for the other one. And I just kind of laughed and said, starving. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I've got an opening. If you're looking for a job, we'll go up there and get an application. And I did. And they hired me part time. So I was doing that plus the marketing jobs for a while. And then they hired me full time. And I've been there three and a half years now. Uh, great company, it's Neiman Foods out of uh, Quincy, Illinois. I've moved around quite a bit in there. I'm now the customer service manager. I have a staff of about 35 to 40 that I oversee with the liquor department, the front desk, customer service desk, all the cashiers, the janitorial staff, and uh, great folks I work with. The, the general manager is a great, great guy. Love working with him. Been really good to me. Uh, company is a great, stable company, and uh, really enjoy what I'm doing. That's kind of my life history of work. <laughs> I told you a lot there, see. Well, it sounds like you like to do community service and uh, administrative I do. jobs. I do. Uh, I've always been interested in politics, which we won't get into parties or, or theories or anything like that, but um, just always been real involved. I worked on a presidential race when I was 18. A uh, local gentleman contacted me, I knew from church, Gene uh, Snodgrass, and said, uh, would you be interested in going to work for Ronald Reagan? And I said, yeah, I believe I would. <laughs> <laughs> and so I worked as a coordinator with the uh, Reagan Bush 84 Youth Coordinating Team. Um, did that for that, that term, and then I met Mike Tate, who was our state rep at the time, worked on a couple of his campaigns. And, Got involved with governor's races and secretary of state races and state senator races and more presidential races and worked and worked and worked politics for 30 years. I was vice chairman of the Republican Party here in Cumberland County when I finally got out of politics, although I still follow it. I'm not involved in it like I was then. I ran for public office. I was a precinct committeeman for, I think, 18 years. Uh, defeated the incumbent when I got elected the first time and then never had an opponent the rest of the time I was in. Um, I spent 10 years on the Greenup Village Board. Uh, here's an article from when I was elected. We uh, brought in a whole new board pretty much, three, three new members that time. And all it turned out three uh, sitting board members. One of them is now the mayor of Toledo. <laughs> How things change over the years. but. Uh, was, was very uh, blessed. I was elected the same time as Tom Bogus and Frank Rip and Wayne Swim. Uh, Wayne was moved into a two-year seat because the mayor had passed away and Randy Callahan had been appointed mayor, so his seat on the board was open, and then the other three of us were elected to four-year terms. So I was lucky enough to be re-elected twice, and then we moved to Indiana, so I resigned my seat when we moved, but enjoyed that time very much. It's something everyone should do. Everyone should be involved in public service at some point in their life because you think you know things and you don't know anything. <laughs> and I'm not being rude to anybody, but until you're on the other side, you have no clue. Uh, we used to get some of the most ridiculous requests and comments from people who just, I'm not making fun of anybody, but they just didn't know. Um, it's really an eye opener on how government works and really, really a lot of enjoyable time uh, these guys that I served with, I still consider them all friends. 
we uh, we became pretty much a, a group. I mean, we couldn't hang out together because of the rules of the law that you can't have more than three of you in one place at any time. So uh, we didn't hang out together, but we we formed a pretty good bond, and we did a lot of good things for Greenup while I was on the board. We upgraded the electric system from the 1950s to modern electricity, which helped Evapco to expand a couple of times. We upgraded the sewer system, or pardon me, the water system. Uh, Greenup was running on two and four inch lines at the time. We brought in 10 inch lines so that we could actually operate our businesses without the neighbor flushing the toilet while you were in the shower and not having any water pressure. Um, and we uh, improved some of the streets. Um, and the thing I'm the proudest of in my, probably my entire life was I went to the mayor and I said, Mr. Mayor, I know State Representative Nolan pretty well, as you do, and I've talked to him a couple of times about our municipal building. It really needs to be upgraded. At the time, if you walked in our back room, you could almost turn sideways and get between the fire trucks and the ambulances if you were lucky. And if they had anything plugged in, you better look out because you might either take your head or your feet out from under you or off going through there. Uh, I worked with Representative Nolan and Governor Edgar for several months and we were lucky enough to get not a grant but a state budget add-on specifically for Greenup. We got $350,000 in funds. And this is an article from where we broke ground. We doubled almost the size of the back end of the building. And we updated the front of the building, uh, the offices. We made the building handicapped accessible. It was way behind the times on the, AD, uh, the uh, laws of handicapped accessibility, ADA laws. Um, we put in new windows up front, a new roof, uh, did a lot of upgrades to build electrical, water. Uh, very proud of that. That was probably, if I have any legacy in my life, I guess that's it, other than my children. That's the thing that I can look at, and it's brick and mortar, and it's there, and it's going to stay. Um, had a great re relationship while I was on the board with the firemen and the ambulance crew. Everybody was just really great to work with. And enjoyed those 10 years. Had we not have moved, I'd probably still serve. I came back and ran for mayor, but I'd been gone a little too long at that point, and people kind of forgot who I was, I think. Uh, did okay, but... Uh, Tom Bogus defeated me, and Tom Tom ran a really good campaign, and Tom did a good job as mayor. So no hard feelings there. I always got along with Tom. We served together for ten years. Uh, but yeah, I've I've always been involved in in different civic things. Uh, I served on the area uh, East Central Illinois area on aging. I served on their advisory council for a couple of years served on the EIU Child Care and Resource and Referral uh, Board for a couple years, um, served as the president of the Cumberland County uh, Interagency, actually restarted that. It hadn't operated for several years when I took over as administrator of their DHS. And it's kind of important that agencies that work with uh, those in need are talking to each other. So we got that started again and it became a regular event. I don't know if it still goes on after the DHS office left the community, if it continued or not, but we hosted the meeting there every month and brought in all the agencies from Coles and Cumberland and other area counties that were involved in projects or, and things in Cumberland County where we could all get together, find out a little bit about what's going on in each agency, have a guest speaker every month and, and learn a little bit more about each agency. Uh, it was very productive meetings, enjoyed those. Uh, served on the uh, board of the, uh, I forget what they called it now, but it's for the food pantry, the emergency food board, I believe it was called for Cumberland County for a few years. I spent about um, six, eight years on the Cumberland County Health Board, actually two different times. I was on the board and resigned when I moved to Indiana, and when I came back, they asked me to serve again. Um, was asked to continue to serve, but decided to step, step away uh, two years ago. I left that board, and we have a great health department, and those folks are doing an excellent job, and folks don't know all the great things that they do, and they should really get, get more knowledge about their health department, because there's a lot of services they provide that folks aren't taking advantage of that they could that would save them some money. Um, but I love working with them. Uh, I love community service. Just gotten so busy with kids and grandkids and work and 
Paul Marty Productions became Star Time Entertainment. I took on a business partner, Cindy Starwalt, and uh, we've grown quite a bit as far as what we do since then. We work with quite a few different musicians and artists from Nashville and work with some comedians. And so I keep busy with that and with, I have another little side business where I sell chocolate and coffee. Um, real busy with that. Well, that sounds like you're a very busy guy. I don't like to sit. <laughs> We'd like to hear a little bit about your uh, your music, though, if you have something that we could even listen to. I do. We, we brought a video of a performance we did. I hadn't played music. I played in the 80s, or sang, I guess I should say. I don't play an instrument. I sang in the 80s with a band called The Descenders from Greenup, and really enjoyed that. And as I mentioned earlier, my last gig with them was a fundraiser for this building. Um, left the band, got married, raised a family, always missed the music business but couldn't be involved in it while I was taking care of family uh, once the kids were grown when I was working at DHS one of the other employees there is Nancy Gable and uh, Nancy asked if I would do a show at the Relay for Life now I hadn't sung I didn't have a band I hadn't done anything for years She'd heard me singing around the office. So I agreed to do it and finally found a gentleman to play guitar for me, Mark Copley, who was at that time the Nazarene church minister, agreed to play, car play guitar for me. I did about a 45 minute show there and I was bit again. I had to get involved. So started looking around for a band and about that time I was invited to sing with the Hootenanny guys at the Green of Hoot Nanny, and so I started going to practice with them every week and had a great time with them and started singing on the Hoot Nanny, which I've been doing for about eight, ten years now. Um, started going down to the Edgewood Opry. Somebody told me there's this great guitarist down there. You should try to get him to play lead in your band if you're going to form a band. So I went down there. Well, yeah, he's a great guitarist. He's played for Merle Haggard and Mel Street and Barbara Fairchild and everybody who's anybody in Nashville. He didn't play in Nashville. He played in Nevada at a place they used to call Nashville, Nevada. Um, he's toured the world, he, or toured the country. He uh, was a studio musician in Las Vegas. That's how he met Merle, as I recall the story. He's played with Waylon and Willie and different ones, and just a great, great guitarist. And you can see him for free every Friday night at the Edgewood <laughs> Opry. Incredible man, incredible talent. His name's Terry Smith. But when I went down to Edgewood, I met him, and eventually he did become my lead guitar player. And he introduced me to some other musicians, and we started a band. And the same Nancy who asked me to play the Relay Lay for Life asked me to play at the Cumberland County Fair. And this video is of our very first show as a band. We played the Cumberland County Fair, and this is one of the songs we did that night. One of my favorite songs. It's an old Marty Robbins song called uh, Ruby Ann. Always been one of my favorites of his. I love to do his music because he has such a range and I love to try to do those high notes that he does. And sometimes it's way too challenging and I can't do it, but I love to try. <laughs> so this is a video and I'll just throw my hat on for a minute because if you see me singing, this is the way you see me. And yes, I have my boots on. <laughs> <laughs>
can't romance your fellow. Ruby and to the hand of this poor, poor man, and true love for the thing. Said Ruby and to the hand of this poor, poor man, and true love for the thing. Okay, so that's a little bit about what we sound like. And Terry still plays for me, and the, lead, the bass player, Jerry May over there, he's from uh, Clay City, he still plays for me, Terry's from Fairfield. And we're going to do a show here in November, I don't have anything else set up right now, we don't play bars, we only play places that are non-alcoholic, um, so that limits our playing somewhat, um, but we've got a show in November we're going to open for a gentleman. put that, I don't know, by the name of Tim Atwood. This is Tim's latest CD. Tim was the pianist on the Grand Ole Opry for 38 years, and he's just recently went out on his own, the last about three or four years now, he's been out on his own, and this is his latest album, or latest CD. I still call them albums, because I'm old. <laughs> uh, people don't know what an album is anymore, but uh, Tim's an incredible talent. He does a lot of duet work with Jeannie Seeley. Um, Back in the days when he was on the Grand Ole Opry, the daytime shows, a lot of times he and Jeannie would do a lot of duets on the day, daytime shows, but he also did some night shows. A well, funny story he told me uh, years ago, the gentleman that was in charge at the Opry at that time had him play six songs in a row. Well, Bash, Bashful Brother Oswald was standing in the back room at the edge of the stage, and he said, what's wrong with the guy that was in charge, and I can't call his name at the moment. And he never even let Elvis play an encore. <laughs> but Tim played six songs in a row. <laughs> but he's, he's an amazing pianist and a, a great, great singer. Uh, we just had him at the Jewett, Christian, or the Jewett Community Church a couple weeks ago. He's a good Christian man, and he did a, did a gospel concert over there, and they had a little ice cream afterwards and had a real nice time visiting with him. And right before that, he was at Calvin and played the Calvin Pioneer Days. And then in November, he's going to be at Herrick on, I think it's the 22nd or 23rd, which is a Friday night, and we'll be opening for him there, and then he'll be at Edgewood the following night at the Edgewood Country Opry. Since we got to talk in music, I'll just show you a few other sure. pictures here. This is my friend Leona Williams. Leona was married to Merle Haggard at one time. She's a well-known singer-songwriter, uh, written hits for many, many artists. This is her son, Ron, who is one of the hosts of the uh, Midnight Jamboree, the Ernest Tubb Midnight Jamboree. This is Rockin' Reggie Vinson. Reggie is the nephew of Cousin Minnie Pearl. Now, he was involved in rock and roll music. He actually worked with Alice Cooper and co-wrote Billion Dollar Babies, which was one of Alice's big hits years ago. Reggie lives in Arizona and still is in highly involved in music business. I don't, didn't bring a picture, I didn't have one handy, uh, of Little David Wilkins. Little David had a big hit with a song called Butter Beans several years back. That is still kind of a novelty hit around, and I hear it every now and then at Edgewood because the owner's wife likes to do it. Um, and she's, she's a bit of a comedian, so she has quite a show she puts on with it, choreography and stuff while she's singing it. This is my close friend, I call him my close friend, Leon Everett. This man wrote a song, or sang a song, I shouldn't say he wrote it because he did not write it, but he performed a song, it was actually written I think by Rex Gosden, uh, Vern Gosden's brother, called Just Give Me What You Think Is Fair. It was a big hit in 1983, it was the top selling song of 1983. Um, Leon had 11 straight top 10 hits in the early 80s. He was set to become the next George Jones or Merle Haggard, but the alcohol got to be too much. And he didn't like the way things were handled in Nashville, and he had some problems, and he ended up walking away from music. Well, I never knew what happened to him. I didn't know the backstory, And I had kind of forgotten about that song. I liked it in high school, but I kind of forgot about it. And when I started singing with the Hootenanny guys, Jim Sisney used to do Just Give Me What You Think Is Fair. And I asked him one day, I said, I kind of remember that song. Who did it? He said, some guy named Leon Everett. He don't sing anymore. I don't know why. So I looked him up on YouTube and found a video of him singing. He was the first country singer to ever sing at Wembley Stadium in London, England. 
He also was the first man to ever be, a country artist, I should say, to ever be the uh, Grand Marshal of the Mardi Gras Parade because his other huge hit, Hurricane, was a song about a hurricane hitting New Orleans uh, years and years before we had the recent hurricane in New Orleans that devastated the place. But uh, that song's been a, it's been played for years and years. A rock group actually just redid it, or a pop group, I guess, or, uh, just about six, eight months ago, they had it on the charts as a pop song. But Leon had a, had a great hit with it. Um, and like I say, his other song, Just Give Me What You Think Is Fair, it's my all-time favorite song. I just love it. I love to sing it. I love to hear him do it. I tried for three or four years to get in touch with him. When I would text his messages to his page on Facebook, I would get a real curt comment back from whoever was managing that. I found out later it wasn't Leon. Um, Leon sings at his church. If you want to hear him sing, you'll have to come to his church. It's in uh, South Car Aiken, South Carolina. Well, I don't travel much. <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever get to Aiken, South Carolina, but I kept being persistent and trying to get in touch with him. And then one day I just came across something on the internet um, about him going back to Nashville. And so it gave a couple names, and one of them was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Adams, who runs Jimmy Adams Media, or Jam Records. I got in touch with Jimmy and asked him about Leon and said I'd like to have him come to a concert here in Illinois. And Jimmy was just thrilled. He said, well, he just got started again where we've been looking for places to play. So he came to Edgewood and did two shows, and we just had a big time. He's just like my brother. I mean, he's just a great guy, good Christian man. Half of his show was gospel music, half of it was country songs. He doesn't do anything that he considers to be um, unfit. He's, he's thrown out some of his big hits. He won't sing them if they've got comments or things in them that he doesn't think he should be singing about. Uh, just a wonderful man. We hit it off and the minute he stepped off his RV, we had a great time together. And he absolutely gave me the thrill of my lifetime. We opened for him, Cindy and I, and uh, the second show. We had Millie Lee open the first show. And Cindy and I, Cindy Starwalt and I opened the second show. And when we finished, I introduced him. He came up on stage and he sang, just give me what you think is fair. And when he got done, he said, I know Paul sings this sometimes here. I'd like for him to come up and do it with me. So I went back up and we did a duet of that huge hit with the star who made it, with the guy who made it a hit and was a star for years. Uh, just an absolute thrill of a lifetime. And we keep in touch. I talk to him on Facebook quite a bit and keep him, follow what he's doing. He just recently played the... Uh, American Truckers show uh, for the first time ever. That was quite a hoot for him. Had a bad, bad accident happen on his way back though. Uh, thankfully no one was hurt, but there was a vehicle torn up pretty bad and his motorhome suffered a little damage as well. But love music, love being involved in it, love working with these stars and getting to know them. Uh, I mentioned Tim earlier, Tim Atwood. He is now working quite a bit with Lori Morgan whose father was a major star at the Grand Ole Opry, and Lori was as well, and her late husband, Keith Whitley, as well. Um, earlier this summer, Tim's wife said, hey, we're going to Lori Morgan. She's going to have this chicken thing, and she'll be fixing whatnot. And come on out. Just like I always went to her home for the visit, you know. But that's what I'm finding out. These folks aren't really, you think of them up here, 90% of them are just common folk like you and me, and they're just good people. And an awful lot of them are good Christian people. And I just really enjoy working with them. So I love the music business. I talk all day about it. Well, you've had a very interesting life. Um, there was one other thing I think you wanted to talk about, uh, your years of coaching local and travel softball. Yeah, I kind of touched on with my daughters. I, I love kids. I love coaching the little, wee little ones. I had a 10 and under Cumberland Vets team. I worked with a 12 and under team in Indiana, uh, the Jennings County Stingers. And then I came back to Illinois, had the 12 and under Cumberland Vets. And then the Charleston Chill organization contacted me and said they would like to start a 10 and under team. They'd been impressed with what I'd done down here and asked me to come up and start their team. So I coached up there for a couple of years. One year 10 and under, second year 12 and under, but I had to quit in the middle of the season. Uh, 
had some problems. They thought I'd had a heart attack initially. Um, failed the failed the health test, the uh, stress test. stress test. Not the running part. I did fine on that. I failed the sitting part, <laughs> where you lay in the tube and just they record what's going on. I failed that part. I'm not quite sure how you do that, but uh, they sent me then to Springfield to St. John's and they did a. Uh, the word escapes me now. They ran the tube up to check the blockages in my heart and everything, and the doctor said, "No, you're you're in pretty good shape. Don't worry about it. It wasn't a heart attack, as best as we can tell." But through all that, I gave up coaching. Uh, then I did coach with a couple of other fellows, a 16 and under, uh, Charleston Chill for one year when my daughter was playing on it. But we've traveled all over the United States with ball. Uh, went to, been to South Carolina finally with ball team. Uh, went to Chattanooga. Uh, Shanna pitched in the, uh, my middle daughter pitched in the NSA National Championships out there. She was 16, pitching on an 18 and under team, and she pitched every game but one for Charleston in that tournament. They ended up fourth in the nation, and uh, she either started the game or, or relieved in every game but one. The umpires thought she was a college pitcher. They came over and asked me what school she played for because they'd ask her, and she told them Cumberland High School, and they thought she was pulling their leg. And I told them, I said, no, she's just 16. They didn't believe it. They kept quizzing me and my wife because they didn't believe she could possibly be 16 and throw that well. Well, she ended up first team All-Stater and playing college ball, so she was a pretty good little athlete. Uh, just love the kids. Those girls that I coached on the vets teams, they're still my kids. Uh, you know, I, I follow their lives. I'm friends with a lot of them on Facebook and the girls in Indiana as well. And in fact, one of our girls is getting married in a couple of weeks and we've been invited to go out to to North Vernon for the or Seymour for the wedding. Um, don't know if we'll get to go, but I'd sure like to. But softball is a family. It really is. There's a lot of folks in it that you get to know. Interesting story. We were in Chattanooga, or pardon me, we were in Jackson, Tennis, Jackson, Mississippi, for a tournament when Shannon was eight and playing on the ten and under Cumberland Vets. And they got, I think it was sixth in the nation that year. Nancy Gable was coaching them. Um, but sat, it was miserable hot, and we were there in August, of course, and people were passing out, sitting in the stands watching the games. It was so hot. I don't know how little girls played in it. But got to talking with a guy that was a local there and had a real nice chat with him. And three years later, I'm in Columbus, Indiana, at a tournament, and this guy walks up and calls me by name. Says, I saw your Jackson hat you had on. I knew that was you. And then I heard him announce your daughter. And I was sure it was you. He said, so I had to come over and say hello. Hadn't seen him in years. I only met him one time, but he remembered me. But it's like that. I actually met, we were in East Peoria at a tournament, and I met one of my friends from kindergarten at Piatone. Forty years later, he was coaching the team that played on the diamond ahead of us. I heard him announce his daughter's name, and I thought, that can't possibly be. And so I asked one of the other players that was sitting there, I said, they said that girl's name was Posing? And I said, yeah. I said, any relation to Todd Posing? The kid said, yeah, that's her dad. He's the coach right over there. I couldn't believe it. I hadn't seen him in years. And he remembered me. I was surprised. We had a nice chat afterwards. But it had been, like I say, about 40 years since we'd seen each other. Um, it's just amazing the people and the, and the things that you do together. I've got friends all over from softball. Love to get in it again when the little ones get old enough, the grandkids. I saw a video the other day of the granddaughter throwing her first softball, and she's got an arm. <laughs> so I'm, Grandpa's waiting. We may have to start coaching again when she gets a little older. But I, I love that time in my life. And I want to say before we get done here that we moved away from Cumberland County for 22 months. This is home. Uh, I can't imagine ever leaving Greenup again. Uh, there's not enough money in the world to get me to leave. Although the taxes in Illinois are starting to pry at me a little bit. I, I, I like the South, but this is home and I love it. I'll probably be here till I die. Um, I'll probably go visit the South quite a bit when I'm retired, but, but I'll always be a Cumberland County person. Even though I wasn't born here, I spent most of my life here. And it's a great place and a great place to raise your kids, a great place to, to live, low crime, few problems. People complain about our taxes, but they're actually pretty low compared to a lot of places. 
and Greenup especially, well, utilities are really low. The town does a lot to, to take care of things and keep the town up uh, and uh, just a great, wonderful community. And, and I love it and I'll be here till I die, I imagine. Well, you have had an interesting life and it still continues. And we'd like to thank you for being our guest today. Well, thank today. you, Sue. I'm still a little befuddled as to what I've ever done that you'd want to interview me, but I, I've enjoyed it. It's been a lot of, a lot of fun to talk to you oh, about these you. memories, some of these things I hadn't thought about in years. Thank you. Thank you.